1st May, 1863, Battle of Chancellorsville. Prior to battle, Commanding General of the Union Army of the Potomac, General Joseph Hooker. My plans are perfect, and when I start to carry them out, may God have mercy on General Lee, for I will have none. The rebel army is now the legitimate property of the Army of the Potomac. They may as well pack up their haversacks and make for Richmond. I shall be after them. Now, when General Hooker does arrive, he's going to issue this general order stating, and I quote, It is with heartfelt satisfaction the commanding general announces to the Army that the operations of the last three days have determined that our enemy must either ingloriously fly come out from behind his defenses and give us battle on our own ground, where certain destruction awaits him. Well, not as serious shot as they fired in this battle yet, and he's already claiming victory. You know, the good thing about it is his army is very confident too, but all of his army is not here at this time. And then by the time of the Civil War in 1860, and Chancellor dies, and a widow who lived not far from here, Frances Chancellor, she moves into the house uh, with her six daughters and her son. So that is the family that is occupying Chancellorsville at the time of this battle. Uh, at that time, this property was 800 acres in size. So imagine a much larger, vast property that continued to the other side of the road as well. And the chancellors enslaved 20 people here as well. Across the road from us, if you look and see the cannons off in the distance over at Fairview, that is where the chancellor's overseer lived. So it was a man named George Moxley. He lived there with his family. He managed the enslaved population here at Chancellorsville. Prior to battle, Confederate artillerist. Up the road from Fredericksburg comes marching a dense and swarming column of our shabby gray ranks. And at the head of the road, General Lee and Stonewall Jackson. We were not going to wait for the enemy to come and attack us. We were going on the war path after him. How about the state of the war that's going to lead to this battle? You may have learned a little bit about that from Stewart this morning as he gave that big, big picture. But we are at the exact halfway point of the Civil War, right? Two years in, two years left to go. Um, in the north, there's, I guess, some frustration. Um, I guess you could say there's also a little bit of, of war weariness by some, you know, why can't we win this thing, right? We have, um, we outnumber the South in a lot of different capacities. Uh, doesn't seem like we can get the job done, at least not in the East. Note, 1st May, 11.20 a.m., the first shot was fired. By 2 p.m., Hooker's men were forced to retreat. Many of his subordinates were not pleased. My God, General George Meade exclaimed, if we can't hold the top of the hill, we certainly can't hold the bottom of it. here, walking you across the entire battlefield, over from a Union position up to a Confederate position. But before they ever became Union or Confederate, we just walked across several farms where people made a livelihood before there was ever death that was involved in this spot. So as we start to think about everything that Pete has just shared with you, and the discussion that you've had has been outstanding. I appreciate all of your input. It's been great. Let's start thinking about what this looks like from a Confederate standpoint. What does it look like to the people who lived here before the war? So you gave us a really good understanding, an idea, a, a perception, an impression of what the Union perspective is. What is the Confederate story? What is the narrative that we've grown up knowing here? What's the story of Chancellorsville with the Confederates? Survival. And I heard victory. All right. Yeah, so we're dealing with some bottom line stories here. Laws tries from here, the Union troops went back up. But if Jackson hits them, they might not be able to back up. However, General Hooker thought he had them just where he wanted them. Again, his subordinates disagreed. The retrograde movement had prepared me for something of the kind, General Couch wrote, but to hear from his own lips that the advantages gained by the successful marches of his lieutenants 
were to culminate in fighting a defensive battle in that nest of thickets was too much. They use captured Union hardtack boxes as chairs. So this is known as the Cracker Box Conference. And they discuss on how to proceed. And they feel that, you know, they want to try to keep the initiative, but they don't want to throw Confederate forces blindly at the Federals who are going to be dug in around the Chancellor. So maybe they could attack at a point where the Union Army would not expect it. So as they're discussing all this, Confederate Cavalry Commander Jeb Stewart rides in and reports that the flank, the right flank of the Union Army is not anchored on any strong defensive position. It's not on a hill, it's not on a, a body of water, it's kind of in the air, so it could be ostensibly vulnerable. Right? So that seems like a place to maybe target for an attack. The question then becomes, well, how could you get a force there undetected? And Jackson's chaplain knows people in this area because he's a local. And he says, well, we know Mr. Relford right down the road. Let's go ahead and talk to him. Well, Mr. Relford reports that a logging road had been cut through the wilderness prior to the Civil War. And it just so happens that it leads all the way out to just the very point that's vulnerable on the Union Army's right flank. Now, does that completely exonerate O.O. Howard? No. Throughout the day, he had received intelligence reports from Von Gillis, the skirmisher, saying, I think there's a lot going out there. Colonel Lee of the 55th Ohio said, for God's sake, do something. It drives everything to an inevitable conclusion. The destruction of the Union Army, or at least the 11th Corps, an ultimate Confederate victory. But when we think about this, why do we remember this event this way? Why does this resonate with us 160 years later, when you could be inside in war, <laughs> and you're out here in the middle of a field, thinking about things that transpired over a century and a half ago? What is it about this that called you out here? When you think about Chancellorsville and this flank attack, what resonates with you? What do you think about? Just throw out any kind of word. Audacity. Audacity is one I hear. Unexpected. Unexpected. We did not realize the hopelessness of our position or know well enough to run. In a matter of moments, the 119th New York's color guard, the soldiers carrying the regimental flags, had lost nine of its 12 members. The colonel, the regiment's colonel, a guy named Elias Peisner, who was a well-respected professor from Union College in Schenectady, New York, is killed. 119th New York's first action. The colonel is killed, the color guard is wiped out, and the survivors start to stream back in confusion down the turnpike. For retreating Union soldiers to tie into, look at the map there, you'll see a variety of different units. Survivors from Von Gilson's brigade are here. Survivors from Szyzhanovsky's brigade are here. In grand totality, about 5,000 U.S. soldiers from the 11th Corps end up right here. Lieutenant okay. Shepard Pryor, Dole's Brigade. Near Meltai Chancellor's house, a third line of resistance was encountered. Men of ordinary valor might have halted to regroup, but not Dole's Georgians. A quick examination was all that was needed to indicate that here was a different situation. A contingent of fresh northern troops protected by shallow earthworks and backed by potent artillery. 2nd May, 6 p.m. Union 11th Corps Commander O.O. O. Howard. More quickly than it could be told, he sadly observed, with all the fury of the wildest hailstorm, everything, every sort of organization that lay in the path of the mad current of panic-stricken men had to give way and be broken into fragments. Right after the battle, and that is from a guy named Richard Wilborn, who's the Chief Signal Corps Officer of the 2nd Corps. By his account, he is with Jackson for the duration of the wounding. From walking next to him, from when they're, they're down the road, according to, to Wilborn, 
from the time that Jackson is shot, Wilburn is never far away from him. You'll see the quartz boulder that's off to the side there. Yeah, so that's the first monument to Jackson's wounding. Uh, it's quite possibly one of the first um, monuments on any of our battlefields. 2nd May, 9 p.m. Confederate General A.P. Hill to General Stonewall Jackson. General, he said, are you much hurt? I think I am, replied Jackson. And all my wounds are from my own men. I believe my right arm is broken. The terrain and what to do with that, which is also a salient that could be uh, ostensibly cut off from the rest of the Union Army if the Confederates converge upon them. And um, that's always a tough one because I feel that Sickles and the Third Corps, you know, they say they can hold this, right? And that would have divided the two elements of the Confederate Army as they tried to reunite. Um, what I could never understand, I know Lee is very caught up on we have to reunite, which I, I get, you don't want your army to be separate. But I could never figure out, like, why must you reunite at Hazel Grove? If you want, you could re just, you know, redeploy your troops and you can realign to the south. 3rd May, 1863, dawn. Union Sergeant Rice Bull, 123rd New York Volunteers. Never were there a more beautiful sunrise, not a cloud in the sky. It was an ideal Sunday morning, warm and fair. It seemed like a sacrilege that such a sacred day should be used by men to kill and maim each other. O'Neill is going to be grievously wounded, shot through the thigh with the fuse off of an artillery route. Nice big honking piece of metal. And those guys, they didn't stand up here much longer either. Before they're going to be falling back to those refaced trenches. The Confederates aren't getting to Chancellorsville. They're actually starting to get away from Chancellorsville. So at Hazel Grove, it's often associated with the third day of the fighting um, during the Battle of Chancellorsville, that's what the cannons are set up to represent. But there are a lot of different things that happen on this particular piece of ground over the course of the battle. So the battery has gone into battery via the planned action front. The guns have been unlimbered which means they were removed from their limbers, which contains the ammunition, and the teams are going to loop back around and come into position to have the ammunition ready behind each gun. The men are going to unkey the implements and get the guns prepared for action. Third May, 1863, morning. Confederate staff officer. The scene can never be effaced from the minds of those that witnessed it. The troops were pressing forward with all the ador and enthusiasm of combat. The white smoke of musketry fringed the front of battle, while the artillery on the hills in rear shook the earth with its thunder and filled the air with the wild shrieking of the shells that plunged into the masses of the retreating foe. To add greater horror and sublimity to the scene, the Chancellorville Courthouse and the woods surrounding it were wrapped in flames. It was then that General Lee rode to the front of his advancing battalions. His presence was the signal for one of those uncontrollable outbursts of enthusiasm which none can appreciate who have not witnessed them.